Well, let's take our seat, church, and let's grab our Bibles, and let's turn to the book of Hebrews, and you can turn to Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5. If you are uh, visiting with us, we are studying through uh, the book of Hebrews, verse by verse. We started in chapter 1, and we've made our way now to chapter 5. And if you'd like to take notes in your bulletin, you'll also find a handout that will help you follow along and hopefully glean the most you uh, can from that. As you look at those notes, you're going to discover that we've already seen, they're just printed there for you in your outline, that the theme of the book is how much Jesus is better, better than any and everything. Not only to these Jewish people, but to you and to me, every believer, honestly, every believer who truly is converted, who's truly come to Christ, would have to say that Jesus is better. We're stupid sometimes, right? That we think this over here is going to satisfy us. But in the end, we keep coming back to realize that Jesus is better. And so that we don't miss that Jesus is better, you see there in your notes, there's warnings that come up in the book of Hebrews. Uh, We are warned over and over again, don't drift from the word, don't doubt the word. There are three more warnings that will be in the book of Hebrews that we'll see as we work through the book. But those two are just ways of reminding us that really there is a danger to hear about this great Jesus, to sing about this great Jesus, to hear all the right truths, and even be connected with the people who believe about Jesus and somehow just drift past the gospel and really doubt that whether God would save you or God would reconcile you and forgive you. And so the warnings are, don't do that. Don't do that. Now, as you have your Bible open to Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to come now to the main focus of the book of Hebrews. And it actually begins in chapter 4, verse 14. And it goes all the way through to chapter 9, verse 28. And the main thing, the thing that you're going to hear over and over in so many ways is how Jesus is a high priest. This large section from chapter 4 to chapter 9 really is going to do that so that you'll just more and more find out how much Jesus is better and superior to any and every thing. So as we've been looking through this, we've been looking at chapter 4, verses 5 through 10, which is a part of that large section, which just kind of introduces us to Jesus as our great and perfect high priest. Those are two things he wants you to know as you get to begin seeing of what it means for Jesus to be a high priest, that he is both great and he is perfect. And that is what chapter 4, verse 14, down to chapter 5, verse 10 is all about. Now, there's an unfortunate thing that happens in our translation right here. Because we started studying last week in chapter 4, verse 14, and we worked down to verse 16. And in your mind, you look at your Bible and you go, okay, now we're at chapter 5. But you know that in the original letters that were written to the church, this letter that was written to the Hebrews, there are no chapters and there are no verses because they're letters. And, and, and sometimes, as the, as the translators have done, they have divided up these letters for easier reading and to keep sections together so that you can focus on what's being said. They've made chapters and they made verses, but sometimes those really get in our way. And today... The break between chapter 4, verse 16, to what is called chapter 5, verse 1, gets in the way. Because the thought begins in chapter 4, verse 14, and works its way all the way through without a break, without a stop, to get you to think all the way down to verse 10 about how Jesus is great and Jesus is perfect as a high priest. So here's what I want to do to read our text this morning. I want to read from verse 14 straight through to verse 10 of chapter 5, and I want you to follow along. Therefore... Since we have a great high priest, there's the first time he's called that, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weaknesses. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. 
And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, there's the phrase, perfect, not only great, but perfect. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So as we have read those verses, we have just reminded ourselves of two things that are important about Jesus. He is a great high priest. And what makes him great, we learned last week, just as you see in your notes, his priesthood. Think about it. The writer is contrasting the Old Testament priest, that high priest who would go in once a year and offer up sacrifices on behalf of all the children of Israel. And he, it was a good high priest. But this high priest is great because Jesus didn't bring the blood of bulls and goats. He brought his own blood which he had shed on Calvary. And all that imagery of the Old Testament of them shedding blood year after year was pointing to what Christ would do with his shed blood. He would sacrifice himself on the cross, bearing the judgment for sin in the place of sinners. And then, as we saw in those verses, he passed through the heavens, ascended up into heaven, into the very holiest of all holies, God's very presence, God's throne room, bringing that redemptive blood on behalf of all his people. And that makes Jesus better than any earthly priest, right? There is nobody that's ever ascended to that holy of holies and brought blood that was acceptable. And another thing that makes his priesthood we learned so great was that when Jesus went to heaven, unlike the earthly natural high priest who once he did that quickly got out of there, Jesus has never left. For over 2,000 years, Jesus has been there in the presence of God, representing all the people of God, all the believers, all the family, constantly as their great and sufficient high priest who brought his own blood on their behalf to atone for their sin. And that, brothers and sisters, makes him great. But not only is he great because of his priesthood, we also learn that he is great because of his person. In verse 15, we see that this is the one who has been tempted in all points like as we are, yet he never sinned. And we, and we looked at that and we saw that what that is telling us is that Jesus, though tempted like us, was tempted even worse than we were tempted. We know what it is like to give in and to fail and to fall short. He never gave in. The worst of the worst of temptation and trials and struggles were thrown at him by the devil and thrown at him by the world, and he never gave in to them. So if you're looking for somebody in heaven above who represents you for your sin, it's Jesus. If you're looking for somebody in heaven above who you can cry out to and you can say, this is what I'm going through. Do you understand? Your high priest can do that. And that makes him great. Not only his priesthood, not only his person, but thirdly, his provision. Because when you see in verse 16 that there is a throne there, a throne of grace where you can draw near to for help, what you have just learned is that this God who atoned for my sin through his Son, who is there in heaven as my great high priest, who really understands the struggle that I'm going through, doesn't just say, I know it's hard, man, stick in there. He comes to your aid bringing grace, bringing help, so that you might find him to be the great high priest that he is. And I hope, this and brothers and sisters, what I hope as we looked at verses 14 through 16 last week, that you have been experiencing that in your Christian life this week. That when you found yourself needy and weak and struggling, that you didn't deny it and ignore it and, and blame it on somebody else, but what you did is you ran straight up to the throne room of heaven on your knees, on your feet, however you were doing and in your posture, but you were running there and you were calling on the God of grace who has given his son as your high priest to meet your needs in all of your times. But Jesus is not just great, right? He's perfect. And that's what we're going to look at in verses now, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. That should be chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. I think that's what it is in your notes.
And as you look at this, I want you to understand that the goal of the writer here in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, is to show us how Jesus meets all the qualifications of an Old Testament priest, but not just meets them, exceeds them. And that makes him better than anyone you have ever, ever known. Now, in your notes there, you're going to have a space to write. There are three basic qualifications for an Old Testament priest. In other words, if you were in Aaron's family and you were going to be a priest, that had to be who you were. You just couldn't up and decide, hey, I think I'll be a priest. I think that's a pretty cool job. You have to be in that family. You have to be a part of the Aaronic family. But even being in the family didn't mean you were in. There were some qualifications. And in chapter uh, 5, verses 1 through uh, verses 1 through 4, we get to see what they are like. Here's the first one. First of all, to be a priest, you had to be appointed by God from among men. Notice in verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men, right? Now, this is important. Listen. The one who represents you uh, has been like you. He has been made human. That's the story of Christmas that we're about to celebrate in the birth of Jesus. But it's not that God gave an angel to represent you or other some entity. He gave his very own son. He is taken from among men. He had to be appointed from among men by God. And it wasn't that God just said, okay, hey, how about you angels go be the mediator, the go-between person with the sinners? No, he has to be a man. And he has to be appointed by God. Now, what that means is God appointed these Old Testament priests to be, as it were, ushers. Ushers to bring them somewhere, and that is to God. Picture again the Old Testament tabernacle and the temple and the priest coming on behalf of the people. He is going there to usher them to God. He becomes, as it were, the middle man. And God appointed the man in the middle because of the fact that they needed someone to represent them. If you look down at verse 4, it says the same thing in chapter 5. And, and no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God even as Aaron was. In other words, this responsibility was something that was an appointed responsibility. You were selected and called to be this. Not just anyone or anybody could decide, even if you were in that tribe, that you were going to be a priest. Now, it's important to note here, and I'm just going to put a couple pictures up here for you in a minute, why it is they needed a middleman. Why is it they needed this high priest? Well, the prophet Isaiah reminds them in chapter 59, verse 12, he says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. There is something existing between us. We're kept apart. And your sins have hidden his face from you. You see, every one of these Old Testament people realized that the problem between me and God is this thing called sin. And that's the barrier. And I need someone, some way, to go in the middle and join the two together. And so this picture here, the high priest is just a replica and a reminder of what this individual was like and what he did. And, and he was dressed out in all the particular uh, outfit for purposes and for a design. And the one I want you to really focus on is that breastplate. Because on his breastplate, you can count them up, there are 12 stones. And on each of those stones is a name. And those 12 stones and those 12 names represent the children of Israel, the people of God. And so the goal of the high priest, the middleman, this bridge builder, as it was, was to go on behalf of the people because their sins, and even his sins, he knew he was a sinner too, had caused a separation between them and God, and God, as it were, was hiding his face from them. He would have nothing to do with them until the sin was dealt with. So the high priest goes and he does that. And listen, the person doing that has to be appointed by God. Here's the second qualification. This, this high priest had to be sympathetic with those he ministered to. That's in verse 2 of chapter 5. It says, He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weaknesses. Now this pause for just a moment there. If, if verse 1 was telling us that the high priest had to be appointed, he couldn't just make this job his own 
by his own doing. He had to be called, appointed by God to go and represent the people. Verse 2 reminds us of the attitude he had to have. And the attitude he had to have was one of sympathy towards sinners. Sympathy towards sinners. What it means is he had to get in the thick of their mess. Right? It wasn't a neat job. And if you understand the whole sacrificial system, you realize there are blood, there's guts, there's smells of burning stuff all over the place. And it was a reminder here that there is a death taking place because someone has sinned. And, the, and that high priest, that one representing them on this earthly tabernacle, had to have this attitude of sympathy to get right in the, the thick of their mess. He had to feel their highs and their lows. He had to identify with them. That was part of the requirement. There is one little word I want to, to show you in verse 2 that I think is important. And it's the little phrase there, deal gently. You see it there? He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. That's a very important phrase and it kind of unpacks this qualification of him being sympathetic. When you put this phrase in the Greek here in Hebrews chapter 5, it literally means, it, it means to be in the middle of things. To be in the middle of things. And there's two ways that the high priest dealt gently or was in the middle of things with these people who were bringing their offerings as sinners. First, it meant he was fully engaged and involved in their, their struggle and their sin. He identified with that. He was right in the middle of that. Number two, it meant that he took a middle ground when it came to that struggle they brought with their sin. Because remember, they're coming to the temple because I have sinned against God. I have failed God. I have broken His commandments. I am worthy of judgment and condemnation. And so the high priest had to sympathize with that and get in the middle of that struggle with them. But he also took a middle position when they came. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, there are two extremes people tend to go to when you get in the mess with everybody, right? And all, how many of you know about getting in the mess with other people, right? The mess of their world and their sin and their struggle. If you don't know what it's like, just show up in my office on Monday and I've got about eight hours of it with people, one counseling after another. But you do it as well. You're on the phone with them. You're, you're, you're looking at things on Facebook. You're, you're just in their world. You're seeing what they're going through. And this, this high priest not only would be in the middle of their mess, but he would also take a middle position. And here's what I mean by that. There is one possibility that on the one hand, a person could be on this side so overly sympathetic, so overly grieved, so overly, like, really burdened by them that you're scared to death to confront the sin. That would be one extreme. That wouldn't be in the middle balance here. It would be on one side. The other extreme is over here, and that is, hey, they made their bed, let them lie in it. Let them fix it. I ain't got anything to do with that. I'm not going to get in their mess. I'm not going to be involved with them. And, and so the, the high priest had this calling and appointment by God, but he also had to have this attitude of sympathy. And it's in the middle here where, man, I am broken over your sin. I am grieved over what you have gone through, what the consequences are and the struggles and all of that. But, but, but I am not going to let you off the hook here. I am not going to let you be absolved from responsibilities and what God calls you to do. And that is the role, this sympathetic attitude that the uh, high priest would do. And that's how you deal gently with someone, right? You deal gently with someone by really not just distancing yourself from them, but really getting in their mess. And then when they're in their mess, holding them responsible and accountable as much of a struggle as it may be to do what God called them to do. Because you see, it wasn't just in the Old Testament that you come up to the temple and you bring your sacrifice and you talk about your sin, you confess your sin uh, with this high priest and he goes and represents you. Then you just merrily skip off from the temple and keep living the way you were. That's not the way it worked. I mean, you were coming in contrition and brokenness over your sin and you were coming knowing there needs to be a middleman in the middle of you to represent you before God. And that individual was sympathetic to your struggles and yet he was expecting you and holding you to God's word to do what God had called you to do. And that is the role and the responsibility of this high priest. Why did he do that? Well, look at verse 2 again. Because he knew they were ignorant and misguided. You say, well, what does that mean? 
Ignorant means they were lacking God's understanding. They were uninformed. They just missed it. Either they got wrong information from someone or they followed their own fallen, sinful thinking about something. But either way, they were ignorant. They were missing what they were supposed to do. And so that brings sympathy. It brings commitment to change in that person's life because they are doing this in ignorance and they are misguided. In other words, they're on the wrong path. And that's what gave him sympathy. Now here's a very important note when you think about this role of the high priest in sympathy and God's provision of this middle man. A very important note is this. When it comes to showing sympathy with the goal of expecting the person to change, in the Old Testament with the priest as the bridge builder between God and the sinner, there is no provision made for the person who is not willing to deal with their sin. You get that? Listen to how it is put in Numbers chapter 15. The priest shall make an atonement before the Lord for the person, notice this phrase, who goes astray. When he sins unintentionally, making atonement for him that he may be forgiven. You get the picture? Then notice this little contrast. But the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is native or alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. You see the point here? That there is this middleman provided by God who is to be sympathetic, to really get in the mix of your mess, and to have great sympathy and compassion upon you, and, and, and yet at the same time expect you to do what God's calling you to do in your life. And for that person, the Lord says, there is forgiveness and atonement provided for them. But you bring that person who comes defiantly, argumentatively, who is not going to listen to what God says and what he wants them to do, there is no forgiveness. There is no atonement he's going to cut that person off that's a very very important note when it comes to this issue of sympathy in the old testament and how god would give it it wasn't just a, a sympathy like keep going on doing what you're doing if you're defiant if you're not going to change you're going to continue to blaspheme god by your life you are going to be cut off from his people severe consequences for that person who thinks he can just treat God's mercy and grace lightly and just really act as if grace is just a free thing to go and keep doing what I'm doing. That's a very important note here. Now let's look at the third and the final qualification. He has to offer sacrifices for others. And that makes sense, right? So here he is coming to uh, be appointed by God. That's his call. And then he has to have this attitude towards sinners of sympathy and now verse 3 is about his actions. What is he going to do on their behalf? Well, he's going to offer sacrifices for them. And he offered them to, on their behalf because he knew that, like himself, they were all sinners. And he was obligated, that was his responsibility, to come and bring a sacrifice. So this one who was appointed must assume this attitude of being in the middle of this uh, dealing with sin and his actions were to really bring ultimately a sacrifice and offering before God. Let me remind you of the two kinds of offerings that are mentioned. In verse 1, we just went past it, but go back and look. At the end of verse 1, it's talking about the high priest who is appointed and called by God. He does this in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And um, you can see that in, in, again, chapter 8 and chapter 9. There's references are there in your notes. What does that mean? Well, gifts means those offerings that are about the dedication of the person. So here it is. The, the high priest is appointed by God to really represent, be the middleman between God and sinners. And he comes with the offering, he comes with the sacrifice for this person who is repentant, who is seeking to please God, to live for him. He comes and he brings that gift and he does that so that it might bring a dedication to that person. In other words, that dedication is revealed in the gifts. And this could be, these are, by the way, non-blood gifts. It's not animal sacrifices. This could be money. This could be grain. This could be jewelry. It could be all kinds of things. It's just their material stuff coming and saying, hey, God, I just want you to, I want you to know I'm coming, and I need you to forgive me, and I do want to live for you, and everything I have belongs to you. That's part of what he offered up, gifts. But he also offered up sacrifices, and that really clarifies the sin side of things. 
That's what sacrifices were for. Those blood sacrifices were somebody else died in your place. They paid for your sin. All right, now, let's go now then to the rest of the verses and to see how the connection is. Because what happens in verse 5 is he now takes what you just learned about the high priest, right? He's appointed by God. He must have sympathy, and he has to come make these offerings and sacrifices. He's going to take that truth about this earthly high priest and apply it to Jesus and show us how he is far better. Watch this in verse 5. So also Christ. You see the connection? He's making this connection. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's another way of saying, here's your fill in, Jesus was appointed by God. Verse 5 is from Psalm 2, verse 7, and verse 6 is from Psalm 110, verse 4. In other words, the whole Old Testament was saying that this Savior, this Messiah was coming, and he was going to be appointed as a high priest. And in verse 7, it says, verse 6 rather, just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I wish I could just pass over this one right now. <laughs> Because there's so much to say about it. In fact, chapter 7, when we get there, we'll unpack this whole account of this guy named Melchizedek who had no beginning, no end, no mother, no father, and he's called a high priest of God. And he's going to be compared to Jesus and how much Jesus is of that priestly line of Melchizedek. But since I can't wait till chapter 7, right? <laughs> and, and the writer had to mention it twice in chapter 5. You know, in verse 6 and then in verse 10, I've got to say something about it. And one of the things I want to say about it is, who would name their kid there, right? <laughs> Melchizedek. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's not why it says he had no mother, no father, right? <laughs> that is not the connection. But what about him? Well, there are two things you should at least right now initially note, and it'll show you why Jesus is of the line of Melchizedek's priesthood. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, this is back in the days of Abraham. And Abraham met him after one of his battles, this guy named Melchizedek. And there are two things that describe him in that passage. One, he was the king of Salem. Okay? And that's just the old name for the city of Jerusalem before it was called Jerusalem. He was called the king of Salem. So he's Melchizedek, king of Salem. And number two, he was also called a priest of God most high. You say, well, why does that make him better than Aaron's priesthood? And why would Jesus be in the line of Melchizedek as a priest forever? Well, here's the reason. First of all, Melchizedek was a king. Aaron, nor none of his people, were ever kings. Right? They don't have that authority. But Jesus is a king, right? We know him in the scripture as king. King of kings and lord of lords. He's, he, he's supreme. So in contrast, Melchizedek is called a king, and he is a king of the ancient city of Jerusalem called Salem. And Aaron was never like that, and Jesus is better because Jesus is not only a priest, he's a king. And another thing you want to note about this is that Melchizedek was called a priest of God most high long before Aaron was ever born, long before the Aaronic priesthood was ever established, which means it had no beginning, and it says in the text, there is no end of it. Guess what? Aaron's priesthood came to an end. It began in the Old Testament, and by the time Jesus came and the Jews rejected him and the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, there are no more Old Testament high priests. There are no more sacrifices. So that priesthood is gone. But guess what? This Melchizedekian priesthood lasts forever. Had no beginning, had no end. Aaron's has a beginning, had an end. But Jesus' priesthood has a beginning, and it will never, ever end. So guess what, brothers and sisters? If we live on this earth for another thousand years, we will still be accessing that throne of grace to the one who is representing us fully reconciled to God by his blood. We will find that throne of sympathy Empathy, that throne of grace, that place of help, constantly, it will never stop. And that is a huge thing that makes Jesus better than, better than Aaron because he is of the line of Melchizedek. Well, that's enough. Jesus was qualified. 
to be a high priest because God appointed him and he appointed him of the line of Melchizedek. Number two, Jesus was also sympathetic, right? That's real quickly seen in verses 7 and 8. It says, in the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. Who does this text tell us that he is lifting up his voice to? To God. And what is he doing in that prayer? He is lifting up a prayer that is filled with loud crying and tears. And who is he praying for? He is not praying for himself. That is not what the Old Testament priest was doing. The Old Testament priest was going to represent the sinner before God's throne. And so what Jesus is doing is as he's praying and he's crying out to God real loudly. It is showing his identity and his sympathy with you and me as a sinner and this whole world. That's what he's doing. He is showing us his sympathy. Now, you want to note something here. Most people think, and I believe it does include this, most people believe that verse 7 is referring to the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember when that final hour came and right in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was literally crying out to God, sweating as it were, drops of blood, and in agony, so much agony as he cried out over the sin that he was about to bear for us that he literally was knocked to the ground. Right? And, and, and that verse 7 is about that. I get that. But it's bigger than that. You know how I know it's more than just the Garden of Gethsemane? If you read the verse, it says that in the days, D-A-Y-S, plural, the days of his flesh. So, get this, brothers and sisters. Every day of Jesus' earthly human life, he was in some way, somehow, crying out to God about your sin. Bearing the load, bearing the, this, the weight of what that would look like in his life. And by the time he got to Gethsemane, it was the climax. That's what he was doing. I don't know anybody like that. I don't know anybody that I turn to that's that kind of sympathetic to me. Oh, he is appointed by God. He has a priesthood that has a kingship to it that never has a beginning or an end. And he is so sympathetic and he is so compassionate to sinners. Isn't that, listen brothers and sisters, one of the things that made him so attractive to the fallen world he came into? He was sympathetic. He got in the middle. He got in the middle of the mess and had compassion and tenderness to sinners who were broken in their sin and with shame and he expected their lives by his grace to go in a new direction. So verse 7. So in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Now listen very carefully here. That sounds, I, I, I didn't get that when I read that. Because when I read that he's praying to God through his earthly days that he would be delivered from death, I have to go, he didn't get delivered from death, Right? I mean, the Jews and the Romans took him and they spat upon him. They cursed him. They slapped him. They put him on a cross. They jabbed him with a spear in his side, put thorns on his head. What do you mean he was heard in that he prayed and God answered his prayer? But here's the, the point to watch really carefully here. It doesn't mean that he was saved from death's experience. He prayed before death that he would not enter into it in the garden. If it is possible, do what? Take this cup away from me. But nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. So he prayed on this side before death that his prayer would be heard because he, this was going to be horrible, what he was going to encounter. But the prayer was answered by the Father after death. So that death, could not keep him in the ground. So he prayed, Oh God, in sympathy for sinners, this is the wrath you're going to pour out on them. I know it's your will. Help me, but I don't want to endure this kind of suffering. Please hear my cry. And the Father says, I'm going to hear it, but it's going to be after death, and you're going to be raised from the dead, and you will triumph over the grave on behalf of those sinners. That's the kind of prayer. That was heard. So that leads us to verse 8. We're just about done and we're going to apply this. Although he was a son, 
He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now, we just talked about his suffering his whole life, right? Feeling the weight of our sin, growing in anticipation, coming to the Garden of Gethsemane. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now, don't misunderstand that. He is not saying that he was scratching his head, you know, I wonder if I'm going to obey God or not. But you know what? Things are getting really hard. I'm suffering. I'm going to obey him. That's kind of how we sinners act, right? Uh, whenever, whenever struggles come into our world, okay, God, you got my attention, man. I'm going to obey you now. And, and, and that's a good thing. I get that. But that's not what that's saying about Jesus. That he learned obedience through the things he suffered. What it means here is that through suffering, he learned what real obedience looks like. And here's what it looks like. You don't quit. You don't give up. You keep pressing on to what God has set before you. And that's the kind of obedience that he learned. He learned the essence of obedience, not whether or not he would obey, but the very essence of what obedience looked like. It looks like this. No matter how hard it is, no matter how frustrated I am, no matter how challenging this is, and you have never experienced it to the degree he did, he is showing us that what he does, because he has great sympathy for that sinner and for the need for atonement for their soul, that he will never quit, he will never give up, he will keep on being a faithful high priest for his people. That's what he learned. And then finally, and I want to wrap it up, the last one is he became the sacrifice, right? Right? So if the Old Testament priest was appointed by God, Jesus was appointed by God. If the Old Testament priest had to offer, uh, had to have sympathy, Jesus had that in far more capacity. And finally, just as the Old Testament priest brought a substitute sacrifice for that sinner and dedication and gifts, Jesus did, but it wasn't somebody else's blood. It wasn't somebody else's life. It was his own, verse 9. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Now, again, language here is kind of hard to read and make sense of sometimes. But when it says here he was made perfect, it can't mean that he was, perf that he was imperfect, right? It can't mean that. What it is saying is, as Jesus suffered and had sympathy and compassion towards us and our sin, and realizing the death that he would pay for our sin, he learned what true obedience was about. And as he learned what that true obedience is about, he literally, as it were, continually pressed on to demonstrate what the perfect sacrifice would be, which was himself. He became the complete sacrifice for our sins here. And it doesn't mean for those who obey, like I'm going to start living better for you, God. Obedience here means to obey the way of the gospel, which is repentance towards God and faith in Christ. So the one who becomes, the, who, who finds this, this high priest, this great and perfect high priest, is those who come the way God designed for sinners to come, in repentance over their sin and faith in somebody else to pay for their sin. And so Jesus meets all the requirements. And he wraps up in verse 10 by saying, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now look at verse 11. Concerning him, we have much to say. And I'm grateful that the author put it that way because I have much to say too later on. <laughs> now if Jesus did all three things that a high priest was to do and exceeded them by far. He was appointed by God. He was sympathetic with men. And he became the sacrifice. Then how does that get applied to our lives? This is where I want you to really just let God use a few moments, these last two or three minutes together, to make sure that we really don't miss some good application here. Okay? Because it's not enough just to say, wow, now that verse makes sense to me. Okay, now I see how Jesus is not just a high priest, but he's great and he's perfect. You really can't leave this place ultimately without asking, so what difference is that going to make in my life? What difference? Well, here's one thing it should do. It should, first of all, make you face the question of whether or not you have come to Jesus as your high priest. Now, just let that settle for a moment. I didn't ask you if you started coming to church. 
I didn't ask you if you started reforming your life by stopping drinking and stopping smoking and if you broke a relationship up that was bad. I'm not asking about how determined you are. I'm asking you this very pointed question. Have you ever come to Jesus as your high priest, the one that your hope and your salvation and your eternal destiny is linked to? I was thinking the other day as I was riding down the road, if I were to ask somebody, Tell me what sums up the gospel. What, what, what verse would you give me to sum up what it means about God loving us and God Christ dying for us and us believing on him as our Savior? If I were to ask somebody, what, what verse would you give me and would that be true of you? How many of you know what verse I would probably think most everybody in the world would give about that one verse that sums up the gospel? Yeah, you're right. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a great verse. But it's a verse we're all too familiar with sometimes. And we've seen it too many times at a football stadium and just kind of like John 3.16. So I got to thinking, if I was to pick a verse in light of what we're thinking about of the high priest that would sum up the gospel, what would that verse be? Well, it would be 1 Peter 3.18. It says, for Christ also died for sins once for all. Isn't that a wonderful? The high priest every year bringing sacrifices year after year, everybody being reminded that their sin has never fully been paid for and dealt with. It's just kind of held back for a little bit. But Christ died for sins once for all. The just, that's Jesus, perfect, the holy, sinless one. For the unjust, that's you, that's me. That's your kids, that's your mom, that's your dad, your brother, your sister. That's the people you work with who are not Christians. They are unjust in God's sight. Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Why? Why? Well, the text says, so that he might bring us to God. So I'm going to ask you again. Is that who you've come to to get you to God? To get you reconciled to God? To get you forgiven? To get you uh, ultimately made right and know that you're not going to end up in hell forever. That you are truly confident that you are resting, resting all of your hope and all of your faith in Christ, in Christ alone. And you know that you know that you have been brought to God, right? You, you just don't get church and you don't just get good friends in church. You get God himself. That's the gospel. He might bring us to God. I'm going to tell you, listen, if you don't come that way, there is no way to get there. You hear that? No way to get there. The Old Testament system is gone. There is no Old Testament priest to get you there. And the Pontifex Maximus, the Pope, which means the maximum bridge builder, he can't get you there. There's absolutely nobody and no one in this world who can get you there but Christ. And I just want to ask you straight up again, have you come as a sinner guilty and convicted and ashamed and grieved and repented to put your faith only in somebody who lived and died and was buried and rose again on your behalf because he loved you as a sinner and was sympathetic to you and wanted to save you? Have you come to that one? That's what this passage should do to me and to you. It should remind us that that's where our hope is. That's where our salvation is. Because brothers and sisters, being reconciled to God is the greatest need in our world. Do you believe that really? Really? Do you really believe that? That the greatest need in our world is to be reconciled to God. See, our greatest problem is not a balanced budget in America. Our greatest problem is not getting the health care system straightened out. Our greatest problem isn't, isn't a cure for some dreadful disease or dealing with Islamic fundamentalism or ISIS or terrorism or electing a good president. That is not our greatest need. Our greatest need is to be reconciled to God. Now, I want diseases to get dealt with. I want a good president. I'm just voting for the lesser flawed, Okay. But that's not our greatest need. That is not our greatest need. Our greatest need is to be delivered from divine judgment as sinners who have been born into this world, unable to reconcile themselves to God because they are sinners, always headed against God and in the wrong way, never caring about Him. We need to be reconciled and saved from divine judgment through the way that only God provides. And that's what we need. We need eternal salvation, which He says He is the author of. A forever fix. A forever salvation.
So I'm going to ask you just one final time again. Have you come to Jesus as your high priest? If, that mean, if that, that's so, that means you are done offering sacrifices. You said, I never offered up any bulls or goats. Yeah, you probably get arrested by some animal place, right, if you did that. I get that. But I promise you, you've offered up sacrifices if you haven't come through Christ. Those sacrifices sound like this. I hope God saw that I was committed enough to get up and come to church today. I, hope he, I, I think he'll love me. The sacrifice, if I know God knows it was a real sacrifice to put money in the offering today, I, I, I'm sure he's going to make me his kid and love me and forgive me. That's my offering, my sacrifice. Or this week I've really worked on my lust or my anger or my, my jealousy, my marriage, and done so much better so I know now that he loves me and I am his child. You know, I've really been reading my Bible. I've been praying more than ever. I know I'm going to heaven. I know. Listen, those are your sacrifices. Those are the things that you are counting on to get you forgiven. You will never find forgiveness. Forgiveness is in Christ and Christ alone. He is the only one. Not your Bible reading, not your sacrifice, not your commitment, not your dealing with your sin. Nothing will bring you to God. Only Christ who died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust. And you know what, brothers and sisters? I know I'm just going on. <laughs> I'm wound up. I'll stop. I'll stop. I know. And you thought that I wasn't going to talk about this today, the fighter verse that we were memorizing, right? But this is the place to quote it together, right? The verse that reminds us from John 1, 12 through 13, where our salvation is and why we have it. So let's read it out loud, church. Let's quote the reference and let's read together this verse we've been memorizing as a church this week and focusing on John, uh, from John. Ready? John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Praise the Lord. So the question is, have you come through Jesus as your high priest? And I'm wrapping it up with this one. So do you communicate to others if you've come to him that Jesus really is your high priest? You say, what do you mean? Well, what I mean, as First Peter reminds us, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Did you know that if you're a Christian, you're called a priest, right? You say, i got to wear weird clothes like that guy? Okay, no, you don't have to wear weird clothes like that guy. <laughs> but you are, again, connected with the priesthood of Jesus in the same way that they were connected with Aaron's priesthood. There's a representation that goes with you belong to this priesthood. It says you're a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, people ought to be able to see you belong to this family of priests. Just as the Old Testament had one high priest and thousands of other priests, we have one high priest, Jesus, but all the believers in that household are part of the priesthood. And we are to reflect this. Now, we're not doing this in a redemptive sense. We're not saving anybody. We're not telling anybody like the Pope tries to do, you're forgiven. We don't do that because that's unbiblical. It's not even in the Bible. But though we are not priests in redemptive sense, we are priests in reflective senses, right? We should be proclaiming the excellencies of him. There should be something that's reflected in our life that people go, wow, this is the family you're in. You belong to it. It's so obvious that the one way we magnify him is by telling or singing about and exalting him as the only Savior, right? Who died for our sins. We also proclaim his excellencies by pointing others to Christ as the only way of salvation. But here's the one I want you to take home. Do you reflect that you are a part of this priestly family by the way you relate to sinners around you? Right? Think about that one. If the earthly high priest had to be sympathetic, get in the middle of, deal with the mess, and have sympathy and compassion while holding them to the changes that God had called them to, is, is, is that what you do too? Do you reflect something of that family of the priesthood when you encounter sinners, maybe on the job, maybe in your family? Is that how you do it? Do you communicate to others that Jesus is your high priest? Do they really see that same kind of sympathy? They see that you are in the middle of the mess? Well, if you know the Savior who was in the middle of your mess, right? 
and showed you that kind of sympathy, why wouldn't you show that to the sinners you deal with? You see, it's all too easy when we see brothers and sisters or sinners struggle to talk to everybody else about their problem rather than to get in their problem and be in their mess and be in the middle. On the one hand, wrapping your arm around them. On the other hand, saying, we're going to change this, right? Won't stay the same. Won't stay the same. That's the kind of Savior we belong to. That's the kind of Savior we need to be reminded of constantly. The music team is going to come in a moment as we pray and we're going to sing a song that's just going to remind us of how much we need that Savior as believers to be reminded of so that we might reflect it and we might demonstrate it and people might say, you're a different kind of person. Well, it's because I belong to the priestly family of Christ. That's, how, that's why I'm different. And I hope that as we sing that song, you'll respond in your heart right there in that way. And God will use that to motivate you as you go into that world with those people that you know they're messed up. You know their world's got problems. You know that some of their own mess is their own doings. But that doesn't change your sympathy and get in the mix and the mess that they're in. If you're going to be reflecting Christ as the one you belong to as a great high priest. Let's pray.